chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left of entering into his rest, any one of you might seem to have failed of it. For indeed we have had glad tidings presented to us, even as they also. But the word of the report did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard. For we enter into the rest who have believed. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest although the works had been completed from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere in, of the seventh day thus, And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And in this again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remains that some enter into it, and those who first received the glad tidings did not enter in on account of not hearkening to the word, again he determines a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, according as it has been said before, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, it is Joshua, had brought them into rest, he would not have spoken afterwards about another day. There remains then a sabbatism to the people of God, for he that has entered, or he that enters into his rest, he also has rested from his works, as God did from his own. Let us therefore use diligence to enter into that rest, that no one may fall after the same example of not hearkening to the word for the word of God is living and operative and sharper than any two-edged sword and penetrating to the division of soul and spirit, both of joints and marrow, and the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is not, there is not a creature unapparent before him, but all things are naked and laid bare to his eyes with whom we have to do. Having therefore a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast the confession. For we have not a high priest not able to sympathize with our infirmities, but tempted in all things in like manner sin apart. Let us approach therefore with boldness to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace for seasonable help. This epistle or treatise or book is a very difficult book. But on the other hand, it is a very simple book because it presents one object and that's the person of our Lord Jesus. In that sense, it's simple. The Lord has said in the Gospels already, that we should have a simple eye, means having one object. And that is what the author of the Hebrews tries to bring before his uh, listeners, because it is also, as it were, a, an, a, an address. He is speaking, as it were, to them. And he presents a person before them, that they may be attracted to this wonderful person. And we have seen these were Jewish Christians, but we have seen also that this, these lessons are applicable to us in these days, living in these days, and that we need also to be attracted to the wonderful person of our Lord Jesus. We have seen how he is greater than the angels, and it was very important for the Jews. They had very high esteem of the angels, and then to see that here is a person greater than the angels, God and man in one person. You've seen that in chapter 1. And then how he is greater than man. He is the son of man. And actually chapter 2 we have seen is 
a very complicated chapter because all the themes of the whole epistle are as it were uh, put together there in a, a few compact verses and so it's also in the chapter we have the chapter we have read are many things but already more elaborated but things which we will find back later on in chapter 2 we have also um, seen how we are linked with this wonderful person that he is the firstborn among many brethren and that's so precious to see how we are uh, as it were participators with him partakers together with him, of all these blessings, even of this future glory, in a sense, we may participate in it already now, because by faith we see him crowned with glory and honor. But then we have seen in chapter 3 how there is a danger. Our responsibility is especially addressed. We are here seen as a people in the wilderness, the epistle to the Hebrews, when you keep this in mind, is an epistle for the wilderness. It's like um, other epistles where this theme is very uh, predominant. Uh, Romans, in a sense, the beginning, gives us the wilderness journey. And so there are other epistles which have especially in view the wilderness journey. In contrast to the land, like, Hebrew, uh, like Ephesians, and John, in a sense, and other epistles who speak, like Colossians, of heavenly blessings and the land, the Lord Jesus, there. And there you have more the position, in Ephesians especially, a position which is untouchable uh, by the enemy. The enemy can do nothing. When you are seen in Christ, in heaven, all is settled, according to God's purpose. You are untouchable, as it were. But here we see the people in the wilderness, exposed to all kind of dangers but not only that what's in their hearts and that's what is brought out here in chapter 3 what was in their hearts they started out Israel in the past they started out faithfully they started out with faith but then gradually you see how they fell you find it in 1st Corinthians 10 also explained to us and here especially in Hebrews 3 how uh, those who were responsible belonged to the people of God how they fell in the wilderness and it was lack of faith we have seen last time that especially it was a matter of the heart they had hardened their heart and we have seen a whole list of expressions in connection with the heart's condition they provoked the Lord they were erring in their hearts they were ignorant it is all lack of faith and uh, lack also of the condition of the heart. And so you see how this speaks to us because we are not better than they are. I remember my father once told me when a little boy he heard these stories read to him. He once said, but what a wicked people was this? Until he found out many years later that in his own heart he was not better than they were. And so that is where we come to here in chapter 3 and 4 to find out what's in our hearts to find out also what's in God's heart there's the wilderness the wilderness is not part of God's counsel God had planned to have his people with him in the land for us it is the heavenly land it is to be with Christ and to enjoy heavenly blessings and of course in the context of the epistle to the Hebrews it is especially the future blessings of the future uh, millennium we'll come back to that in a moment which we may enjoy already by anticipation through the Spirit all these blessings but you know the wilderness is necessary to show what's in our heart it's as it were God's school God says wait a minute I want to have you with me but I have certain lessons to teach you and so he uses the wilderness to bring out what's in our heart and he uses the wilderness also to bring out what's in his heart to bring out what provisions we have and so we hope to see tonight the provisions we have in the word of God provisions we have especially in our great high priest now in chapter 3 in the beginning we have seen that the Lord Jesus is presented there again as the apostle and high priest together it's a, a double a type as it were Moses and Aaron both 
typify the Lord Jesus. And we have seen about the house, Moses' house, and now the house of the Lord, the old house and the new house, you could say. That is in connection with the word which was spoken to them. And so we are also responsible in connection with the word God speaks to us. We are very responsible in connection with that. And then we have seen how they uh, deviated from this path of faith. They started out in faith. In Hebrews 11 it says that they left Egypt eh, through by faith. But here they are in the wilderness. And there it shows what's in the heart. And then we have read uh, these quotations from Psalm 95. It was God's uh, intention to bring them into the land. And uh, this psalm is um, referred to many times in these chapters, Hebrews 3 and 4. But because of their unfaithfulness, their uh, hardened hearts, and they provoked God, and so God said, Forty years was I grieved with this generation and said, It's a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So that I saw in my anger that they should not enter into my rest. That's what God does with this generation. This generation which uh, allows the flesh to work doesn't mean that they were not born again. They had no faith, but they lost. Yeah, that's hard. We will study that more in Hebrews 6. You cannot lose salvation, but in a sense you can lose, in a practical sense, your faith. Faith in God, that you stop to look uh, on Him, that you go on uh, according to your own will and self-will and so on. That's what happens here in uh, Hebrews 3. Now, as I said, in Hebrews 6 we hope to discuss more in detail the matter of um, salvation, and if you can lose uh, salvation... That's not the subject now. What we could say then, in, uh, after, the, after uh, the author has presented the greatness of the Lord Jesus as the Apostle Moses and High Priest uh, Aaron, he is going to uh, elaborate that subject on a High Priest, you know, in verse 6, son over his house, I'm referring to Hebrews 3, verse 6, son over his house, whose house we are, we have seen, we belong to the priestly company, priestly family, like Aaron and his sons belong, and his whole family. So, the Lord Jesus is the great Aaron, and he has this house. He is not only a structure, like in the tabernacle, he is not only the assembly of God now as a house, but also a company in the house, like First Peter 2 explains. But then, he, he uh, stops, he interrupts himself, as it were, he says, if indeed we hold fast the boldness and the boast of hope firm to the end. And then he will continue the subject of the high priest in chapter 4, verse 14, where we have read. So what does this mean? That from chapter 3, verse 6b to chapter 4, verse 13, we have a parenthesis. We have again, as it were, um, this point. Now what about you? Are you now putting into practice what I've taught you? That's what he said. Like in chapter 2, we have seen, uh, in the beginning of chapter 2, he interrupts himself also. And he says then, uh, How shall we escape if we have been negligent of so great salvation? It's an exhortation to realize where we are, what path we are going. And so again here in this uh, parenthesis, he starts to speak especially to the conscience. The conscience. I would say this. In presenting Christ, the glories of Christ, he speaks to the heart. To warm our hearts, as it were. But we are also responsible. And so he speaks especially to the conscience to uh, make clear where we stand. And then you could divide these parentheses in three parts. Only last time we have... Um, been occupied with the first part of it, the negative part. Those who fell, those who did not enter into the rest. And now tonight, we hope to see then, from verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, those who really entered into the rest. How this happened, how this came about. There is much to say about the rest then. And then, uh, the third part of this parenthesis is 
about the word of God in Hebrews 4 verse 12 and 13 we see the testing and searching power of the word of God and that is something which belongs to the wilderness where we hope to um, speak about and then after that he comes back on his theme of the high priest the Lord Jesus greater than Moses the great apostle the Lord Jesus greater than Aaron the great high priest and in between we see that the Lord Jesus is greater than Joshua, uh, Joshua that he is greater than David and Solomon that is what we have in chapter 4 so to sum it up you see always a comparison between what was in the past presented in the past he takes the things from their own scriptures he, here Paul we suppose the author of this epistle is not writing as apostle to introduce new doctrine to speak with authority he is here writing as a teacher and he speaks especially to these Jewish Christians and takes their own scriptures the Old Testament to bring out what was there and then through the Holy Spirit to present in these scriptures Christ and that makes the Old Testament so important for us that it is one illustration as it were of the greatness of the person of the Lord and also of his work as we hope to see if the Lord gives us another opportunity in the second part of the epistle. Now it is a difficult uh, portion, um, but let's try to speak about some details. In uh, verse 1 then, the author joins these Christians. He does not place himself above them, as we often have the tendency to do. We want to exhort others, and in our mind we place ourselves above them because they uh, are lacking no he places himself beside them he is also a responsible man to go through this wilderness and to enter into God's rest let us therefore fear he does not exempt himself from this nobody can do that no Christian how good he may be or she may be can say uh, I have arrived already uh, me to me nothing can happen I will not fail no we see here that we are responsible and that we have the possibility to fail doesn't mean that we can lose salvation we hope to discuss that in Hebrews 6 but that we may fail that's the point and we have seen then in this first part of the parenthesis that they have failed indeed with all these points of hardening and provocation temptation and so on we have seen how they fail as a matter of the heart uh, especially but here it is to encourage now us that we will not fail there are two possibilities in connection with the journey through the wilderness so when you keep this in mind it is an appeal then there are two possibilities either we fall either we fail we harden ourselves we fall in temptation or even we turn away we fall away that's apostasy as we hope to see later on also developed in this epistle or uh, led astray by deceit or departing there are many different expressions used to express this possibility of failure and on the other hand the exhortation that we would respond when you see that it's essentially a matter of the heart even in verse uh, 12 we hope to see the heart in connection with the word of God then you see that God wants a response he wants us to respond to the provisions he has given in the wilderness he wants us to respond to the word and to the ministry of the high priest why do we have the high priest to bring us through the wilderness to lead us through what a triumph this is for God to have a people here in the wilderness in a world where God's rejected, where God's rights are despised and set aside, that God would have in the same wilderness a people for himself, for the glory of his name. And therefore he gives these provisions. He doesn't leave us there and forsake us, not at all. He takes care of us, as we have in the Old Testament, as a father carries his son. There are so many provisions in the word of God to bring us through. But it is the wilderness, it is testing ground, and we may fail if we do not walk by faith as soon as self will comes in or pride or whatever you may mention as soon as that comes in and it is not judged then 
through the light, in the light of the Word of God, the failure will be there. So this is the positive side, encouragement to go on. And, uh, as he says here, a promise being left of entering into his rest. That is the promise we have also. We will enter into his rest. Now we hope now to discuss then what is his rest. But also, uh, we have to see that uh, this rest is, uh, in a sense, future. Just mention uh, chapter 2, verse 5. We have seen there that he was speaking about the habitable world which is to come. We have seen in verse 9 of chapter 2 that we see already Christ crowned with glory and honor. But we have seen also that this refers especially to his future glory, the millennial glory, but we see him already in that glory. And in that sense, we might say, we may enter already now into the enjoyment of these heavenly glories in connection with the Lord Jesus. That is one aspect. But on the other hand, we should realize that the full realization of this rest is still future. When we come later on in chapter 6, on this expression in verse 5, um, the age to come the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the works of power of the age to come in that sense also this rest is future we hope to see this in a moment now many have thought that this rest is rest for our conscience like the Lord Jesus has said in Matthew 11 we know that first uh, most of us the Lord said come unto me and I will give you rest. And those who are laden and, and with many burdens, he gives rest. And that is wonderful. I, we cannot speak about this, but that's a wonderful verse. And you may meditate it again and again, and you see how great this is. Now, this rest God gives already now, on the basis of his word, on the basis of the accomplished work of the Lord Jesus. When you will turn to Romans 5, I think our brother mentioned in prayer or referred to it in prayer this rest this peace with God we may have now this is a rest which you never can lose once you have peace with God it is settled forever but you may uh, lose something else that is the enjoyment of this rest this is the enjoyment of this fellowship with God and so we find in the scriptures, then, in the next verse in Matthew 11, another rest, the Lord Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. That means, be submissive to me. Follow me in this path of obedience to God. Now, you see, when self-will enters, you are not uh, uh, carrying the Lord yokes, yoke. You are uh, following your own will. Can you have peace then? Can you have uh, a quiet conscience then? It's impossible. Then you lose that sense of rest, you lose it by disobedience like these people which fell in the wilderness. So this is a rest you may lose. That is a rest you may have when you are obedient. So that is this different. This initial rest, peace with God, and nobody can take that away. It's settled once and for all. But then this practical rest in the circumstances of this life, you may lose that rest if you follow a path of disobedience. But now we come then to this expression, His rest. What is that? God's rest. So there is a place where God would be at rest, where God would be at ease, as well, where God would dwell. That's the song. Where w there would be nothing against God's will, against God's authority, where He would be at ease. Now, we understand that that is future. When we look around here in this world, we see there is nothing which is really uh, in harmony with God's will. Everything is in rebellion. So, we see how God will intervene with judgment, and then He will establish His rest. And then we will find rest in the millennial reign. Um, I, I hope to refer to some verses later on uh, when we come back to that uh, expression, God's rest. Then he says in verse 1 here, uh, any one of you might seem to have failed of it. You 
See, I mentioned already before, it is the possibility of failure. And then verse 2, For indeed we have had glad tidings presented to us, even as they also. So they are responsible according to the light they have received. And so it is with us, we are responsible in uh, relation to the word as it is presented to us. These glad tidings were presented to the people of Israel when they left Egypt, when they were in the wilderness, by Moses. Moses was the one who presented glad tidings to them. And we may think also of this report from the land, and the, the twelve, um, uh, how do you call them, uh, people who came back to uh, the spies, thank you. When they came back, they, present, they gave report, and Caleb and Joshua gave a good report. So in that sense, there were also glad tidings in connection with the land, but they rejected this report. But now, we have seen in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, the Lord is speaking. The Lord is the great Moses. He is the one who uh, presents glad tidings to us. He is the great apostle, and he presents his glad tidings. And so it was with these Jewish Christians, even from the glory, the Lord was presenting glad tidings to them. And so it is today, the Lord speaks through his servants, through the disciples, he speaks and presents glad tidings. What do we do with that? Here it says in verse 2 at the end, But the word of the report did not profit them. Why not? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard. And that's very clear in connection with the message about the land. That there was no faith. They had no appreciation for God's counsel, for the land of God's promise. They had no faith, no obe obedience, no belief, as we have seen. We could translate it also in a different way. The word of the report did not profit them uh, in this sense because they were not linked with those who received it in faith. That would mean this. They were not one of heart with Caleb and Joshua. That's another way you can translate this verse. Both are true, of course. Now in verse 3, For we enter into the rest, for we enter into the rest, we who have believed. So here again you see it is linked with faith. You enter into that rest by faith. So now from verse 3 on, you have those who entered by faith. So far it was more negative, those who fell and failed. We enter into the rest who have believed. We is the Christian we. It is those uh, Paul supposes who are born again, who accept the word of God and who continue by faith. He speaks often of this in, the, in this way of we. And then he refers back again to Psalm 95, as he said, As I have sworn in my rest, if they shall enter into my rest. doesn't mean that nobody would enter into the rest. They, that generation, as we have seen in chapter 3, in these three questions at the end, they will not enter. But those who will have faith, like Caleb and Joshua, they will enter. Now, uh, in connection with this rest of God, he continues still his um, considerations. In verse 4 we see that there are types of this rest. What we have to grasp really is that there is a future rest of God. Referred to in verse 9, there remains then a Sabbathism to the people of God. When God will share his rest with them. And there are in the Old Testament types of this future rest. And now the author is explaining this in verse, from verse 4 on. For he has said somewhere of the seventh day thus. The seventh day is the day after the six days of creation. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So God had finished his works and he rested from his works. Notice here it does not say that he rested in his works. Because this rest was disturbed very soon. God rested from his works of creation, and he still does. In that sense, this rest of God is still continues. He created, 
then that was finished. Of course, we have seen the Lord is also the upholder, the sustainer of the universe. In that sense, his work goes on. But as creator, he rested. And it still continues this rest. But he did not rest in his works because these works were set up against him through the fall of man. And uh, you may uh, think of this verse the Lord Jesus mentioned in John 5 that the Father works and he works also. That's because of this uh, of the fall of sin coming in. So in that sense God had to start to work again. But then in verse 5 and in this again if they shall enter into my rest. Here again he refers to Psalm 95. Now in between there is another type of this future rest that is uh, after the flood. You see how uh, Noah uh, built the altar there on a purified uh, earth and there we have a wonderful type also of the future rest of the millennium. It is not referred to here in this uh, passage. But then from verse 5 on he continues to speak in the context of Psalm 95 and then he says in verse 6, seeing therefore it remains that some enter into it and those who first received the glad tidings did not enter in on account of not hearkening to the word and then he interrupts himself again he says in verse 8, for if Jesus for that is Joshua, wonderful to think of this name really to see Jehovah saves this name Jesus is so precious to us, Matthew 1, and it's already uh, prefigured here in Joshua. Joshua who received his name from Moses, actually. His name was Hosea, and then his name was changed. In the Lord, in Jehovah saves. If Joshua so had brought them into the rest, he would not have spoken afterwards about another day. What does that mean? Joshua brought them into the land. But he did not bring them yet into the rest, you see. So Moses failed with these people, rebellious people. He did not even enter into the land. Joshua brought them into the land, but he did not bring them into the rest. The rest was still future. And then you come to David in verse 7. And then even David says, today, after so long a time. So we see here, by the way, in verse 8, that the Lord Jesus is greater than Joshua also. Because the Lord brings his people into the rest. He's greater than David, as we hope to see now. The Lord will bring them into the rest. But even in David, this rest was still future. But then you might say, but under David, the ark found its resting place. When you go to these uh, Old Testament scriptures, it's wonderful to see how in a sense, what God had said before was fulfilled now. Uh, God had spoken of a resting place already in Deuteronomy 12, where his name would dwell. God had spoken of, uh, about that very clearly. And then you see under David that he brings the ark into this uh, resting place. Psalm 132. Time does not allow to, uh, to study that now, but you may study that at home. You will see then that uh, this rest was realized then. When you would study, I will just refer to a few verses. First uh, Chronicles 22 verse 9 and also First Chronicles 6 verse 31 you see that David is called and also Solomon especially the man of rest. And uh, also in Second Chronicles 6 verse 41 you find the thought of rest. So what does this mean? This rest was realized then. But in the context of this chapter, it's clear that it was only a type of this future rest when the Lord would really reign. And so we see in David and Solomon types of the Lord Jesus as he will reign in the future, in the millennium. And so in this sense, again, we see the Lord is greater than David and greater than Solomon. He says it himself in Matthew 12 that here is one greater than Solomon. So, in verse 9, the conclusion, there remains then a Sabbathism to the, or a Sabbath rest to the people of God. And the Lord Jesus was here in this world. He mentioned to the Pharisees that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath would speak of this rest. We have seen already in connection with creation, Sabbath speaks of rest, 
from God's works. But in this future Sabbath, God will rest in his works. Every sin will be in harmony with God's thoughts. And in that sense, it's still future. And now, when you start to realize that Psalm 95 is in a group of Psalms which speak about this future rest. I think when you see that, it's very helpful. Because Psalm 92 speaks about this future rest of the millennium. Psalm 90 is the people failing in the wilderness. Psalm 91 presents Christ as the one who was perfect here in the wilderness. How much we can learn of him. And then he leads into the millennial rest. And that is Psalm 92. So, when you continue then these psalms, you will see in 93 also the Most High God, in different psalms, 97 also, the Most High God is the characteristic name of the Lord of the millennium, of the future millennial reign. Now, in between, you have this Psalm 95. So, it is very clear that he's speaking there about this future rest of the future Sabbath when God will rest in his words and everything will be in harmony with him and so righteousness will reign as it says in uh, the scriptures first Peter, uh, second Peter 3 righteousness will reign but then in the eternal state righteousness will dwell that's the difference we do not speak here about the new creation it's still part of the old creation that's important to understand this is the continuation of the old creation, but then brought under the leadership of the Lord Jesus. Everything will be brought back to God. And after that only, the new creation will be seen here. But we belong already to the new creation. It's complicated, but that's our privilege. But we will have also a share then in this uh, Sabbath rest. We will enjoy this Sabbath rest from the heavenly side. When you follow this line through the epistle to the Hebrews, we have seen already in chapter 2, that we are being led to the glory in bringing in many sons to glory. We are on the way to glory. So we are on the way to this rest. But we will enjoy this rest and this glory from the heavenly side. That's important to see. And as we have seen already, we enjoy it in a sense by anticipation because we see Christ the one who will be seen publicly in this future reign, we see him already now by faith. And in that sense, we enjoy these things by anticipation. And it's important to see the difference because we have the Lord share so many glories with us. We have already, uh, through the Spirit, the enjoyment of the blessings of the, Father, of the house of the Father. We have the blessings of heaven, all the blessings of heaven. But this is specifically in connection with the future reign. And we will enjoy this with the Lord from the heavenly side. And there will be a people also here on earth who will enjoy it from, the, from this side, here on earth. Verse 10, For he that enters, that would be the best translation, I think, he that enters into his rest, he has also rested from his works. That's also applicable to us. It doesn't mean that we have rested then from our uh, wrong works, evil works, or dead works. The point is then we will be at rest. Now we have to work. Even we see in Ephesians 2 that God has prepared works for us, that we would walk in these works. Now, as soon as this rest will start, these works uh, are not necessary anymore. Now we work for God, in dependence upon Him, but then we will rest. So in that sense, it is very clear that this rest is future. So it is important to see that there is an initial rest, a rest for our consciences, when we have peace with God. You cannot add anything to that. You cannot work to get that. It's, um, it's a gift of God. By faith, of course. Applied by faith. But this is a rest which is future when everything in this universe will be brought under Christ and he will reign and all will be for the glory of God in harmony with God under his righteous reign. In verse 11, let us therefore use diligence. Now again this uh, appeal. You know in this uh, chapter we have several times this appeal. In verse 1 we have seen let us therefore fear. That's 
still, uh, in a sense, negative. But here, it is a positive encouragement. Let us therefore use diligence to enter into that rest. That is where we are, uh, are encouraged to, to do this, to enter into that rest. It's still future, as we have seen, although we may enjoy it uh, by anticipation, but it is still future. We are on our way through the wilderness, like these people was on their way through the wilderness. And then we hope to see in the second part of this chapter the provisions we have to go on with diligence and to, to continue in order that we may enter into that rest that no one may fall after the same example of not hearkening of, to the word. That is the seriousness of the situation. Always these two possibilities. To go on in faithfulness and obedience or to fail because our, of our heart's condition. And now we have the first help. That is the word of God in verse 12. That is the first help we have in the wilderness. And you would say that's not a help any in any way because it is going to judge me completely that's what it is that's true but it is a help because the word of God shows what's in our hearts in order that we may judge these things in order that we may judge self-will is that a help? of course it is because when you would not have the word of God you would not see these evil motives and you would go on like these people in the wilderness and you would fall now God gives the possibility, as a searching light, as it were, to show what's in our hearts in order that we may judge these things. To see, just in a few words, we could say this. The Word of God is still in connection with the Apostle. You remember, the Apostle was speaking the Word of God. That's our Lord Jesus from chapter 1, verse 1, uh, through the whole epistle, in a sense. We see here how he is the great Apostle speaking to us the word of God. And in a sense, he is the word himself also. We see in verse 13, uh, there is not a creature unapparent before him. It's not only before the word of God, like in verse 12, but also before God himself. And that is also before the Lord Jesus, who is the word of God. He speaks the word of God, and he is the word of God. So he lays bare everything which is in us. But then in the second uh, part then in verse 14 to 16 we see how the Lord Jesus is our high priest to support us to sustain us and that's in connection with our circumstances so we hope to come back on that later on this difference the word of God is in connection with what is in us the high priest is in connection with our circumstances to support us to go through this wilderness now, the Word of God has seven characteristics here. It's first of all, living. It's the Word of the living God. And you remember, even in the Old Testament, uh, when Moses spoke, he was speaking living words, as it were, to the people. Even when he was showing the, the consequences of their disobedience, uh, the Word was also uh, exhorting them and in that sense, living word, powerful as we hope to see later on also. So the word of God is living because it communicates life. But it is also living because it presents uh, the consequences if we are disobedient. And it presents then the consequences ultimately in death as we see how the people uh, fell then the second characteristic is it's operative it is effective the, the word of God has a power uh, you may think of what Paul said to the Thessalonians how the word was not in vain but have, had been very powerful effective that is what the word of God is very effective and of course we could uh, find many um, passages in the New Testament which uh, support this thought. But it might be helpful that you would uh, seek them on your own. And then the third um, aspect is it is sharper than any two-edged sword. How serious this is. It's a two-edged 
two-edged sword. That means the word of God is applicable to myself. It's easy to use the word of God, uh, not always easy, but we find it easy to use it towards uh, against others. And we have the word of God as a sword even uh, to attack the enemy. Ephesians 6, it is very clear that the word of God is a sword to help us and to defend ourselves. Very clear. But here it is also presented in its power towards ourselves as this two-edged sword. It is not only directed against the enemy, it's also directed against myself. But that is to help me. It's like a knife, you know, when a physician or uh, in the hospital, uh, how do you say, uh, surgeon, thank you, has to apply this knife, it is first to lay bare everything, to reveal what is the problem. That's the first thing. The second thing then, the knife is used to take away what is wrong. And so it is used to give healing. That is the positive working. So the knife is applied here in a very uh, important way to protect us, to help us actually. First to show what is there, to lay bare everything. Then to cut away what is wrong. And then that he may be healed. Now this is the working of the knife, and the, or the sword here, sharper than any two-edged sword. But then it is described how deep it goes. It's penetrating, this is the fourth aspect, penetrating to the division of soul and spirit, both of joints and marrows. That's the fifth point. So here we see that the word of God would penetrate it goes very deep, the searching, it goes very deep. It doesn't mean that we have to divide everything, that we have to divide soul and spirit, we have to divide what is coming from our soul or from our spirit. Of course, we may discern between these motives, our soul related to uh, our uh, emotions, for example, passions. Our spirit may be more in connection with uh, intellectual things or also the things in connection with God but often we do not even uh, understand the difference but the word of God uh, distinguishes and it goes also on in connection with the joints and marrow so this would say the whole uh, human being here it's summed up soul, spirit, joints and marrow you cannot separate joints and marrow life would stop but the point is here that the word discerns, it penetrates there and it makes clear what is there it lays bare everything and then it is for our good, that's the point it's not to, to um, condemn us it is to make us help to uh, judge ourselves, our motives sometimes we pray but it is only that we may have some ease. It's not really for the glory of God. When you read Psalm 139, I think it would be a good example from the Old Testament to see how this works. How everything is laid bare before God. And this is very helpful. And then at the end of this psalm he says, lead me on the uh, eternal way. He has presented everything before God and so we may present what's in our soul what's in our spirit the intentions that were our heart as we see then in the seventh point all these things are laid bare and open before God and that is what God wants that we would apply his word you know we are our natural tendency is to accept the word of God but so far and not further than that we have sometimes we are afraid that the word of God would uh, be applied to the secrets of our hearts. We don't like that. But to go on in the wilderness, we have to accept it. Otherwise, we will harden our hearts. You see, we come here to the center of human being, the heart. From the heart are the issues of life. When you have the heart, you have everything. When you control the heart, you control the intellect, you control the soul, you control the emotions, the will, and everything. It's from the heart. So how important it is that now the word of God is in full control over our heart. It is so important because we have seen many references that their hearts were hardened, they were erring in their hearts and so on. 
That means their heart was not controlled by the word of God. It was controlled by self or by Satan. Here, the word of God is presented that everything may be uh, judged and brought in harmony with God's thoughts, with the word of God. So this is actually a blessing. It's like Joseph, uh, Jacob, excuse me, Jacob, when he was at the end of his life, he said, now I'll bless you. And when you read these blessings in Genesis 49, beginning especially, you don't see any blessings, but he's telling them the truth, and that's a blessing in itself. And so when the word of God presents to us what's in our hearts, it's a blessing, because it helps us then to judge these motives, to judge what's wrong. Think of Paul. He was always trying to present himself before the Lord, to be led not by uh, human intentions, but only be led by the, uh, the Lord. And then in verse uh, 7, it's in verse 13, it says, And there is not a creature unapparent before him, but all things are naked and laid bare to his eyes. So here we see it's all open for God. For God, we are an open book. He reads the deepest secrets of our hearts. It's all open for him. But that's, the, that's not the point here. It should be open for us too. That's what the Word of God wants. Wants to protect, to uh, detect these things, that everything may be open and bare for us, that we may see these things. You know, in a sense, you might say, oh, I'll wait till the judgment seat, and then everything will be uh, cleared up. That's true. It will. But it's desire of the Lord that it will be cleared to us already now. That we are, in, in a sense, already standing there. We place ourselves before God, and we apply the full power of the Word of God upon ourselves, upon our motives, upon everything. And so, all becomes open and bare also to our eyes, but as being in the presence of God. Now, it might be crushing when you think of this, you might say, wow, well, where, where I am? I'm, ne I'm nowhere. That's true. When we apply this word of God in its power, we allow the word of God to work upon us in this power, we are n nowhere. But that's the right place before God. And then our eyes are turned to the Lord Jesus again. Here we see him in the word of God. You know in Hebrew, in uh, Revelation 1, this sword goes out of his mouth. That's the, that's the same idea. The word of God is a sword. And it, but then it will judge, you know, although in Revelation 2 and 3 you see how he lays bare everything which is in the assemblies. That's also a characteristic of the word of God. Not only in my heart, but he lays bare everything also in the assemblies. But then after that, you see how this sword will judge the whole world. And now, in this time of grace, the Lord wants us to apply these principles, as I said, as healing. To help us that we will not fall in the wilderness, but that we may go on and that we may enter into this rest. And then we see how we have another provision. And that is to carry us through the high priest we have some of the high priest wonderful thought here he is first of all the great high priest again an indication he is greater than Aaron we hope to see that in chapter 5 especially greater than Melchizedek as we hope to see later on he is so great and that's a word which is characteristic for this epistle it's a summing up of greatness as it were when you go on later on we see, and we have seen it already in Hebrews 1, he is seated at the right hand of the majesty. Now, majesty is also in the original the same thought, greatness. So, we have the great high priest, and he is seated at the greatness, the majesty at God's right hand. What a great high priest. He's not only a great priest, but a great high priest. And therefore, we see here, it refers to Aaron. We... Um, Hope to see in connection with Melchizedek, see how great he was. But he was only a type of the Lord Jesus. So this thought of greatness is so important because it helps us again to be impressed by the person who is presented before us. 
not to crush us, that we, but to attract us to Him, to attract us to Him. Here we see then, He is a great high priest. And how great is He? Who has passed through the heavens. We see here, someone who is even greater than the heavens. We have seen that already in Hebrews 1. And here, we see here that he is going through the heavens, that he went through the heavens as man, and later on we hope to see he is above the heavens. So he is, in a sense, in the heavens, as the throne of God is in the heavens. We have here in verse 16, the throne of grace, the throne of God, is now the throne of grace, not the throne of judgment, but of grace. And so, he is in the third heaven. We would say the Lord went through the heavens. Like the high priest in the Old Testament, he went from the courtyard, went through the holy uh, place, and then he entered into the holy uh, of holies. So the Lord went into the heavens. But we have other passages here in Hebrews which say that he is higher than the heavens. So it shows the greatness of his person. In that sense also the throne of God is above the heavens, as we have in the Psalms. It's in the third heaven, but also above the heavens. But then notice, Jesus. Again, this wonderful name, Jesus. This man here on earth, he is it. But then, the Son of God. We can never separate it. We speak of Jesus, we see God. When we study the Gospels, Matthew 1, and so on, and you go on, it is Jesus. But it is at the same time God, you see. He is the Son of God. Again, we hope to see later on that He had to be Son because we are sons. And He is now also as a high priest. He is as Son high priest because He is the... Um, the first of this company of priests, of sons. But here we see how the Lord Jesus is high priest in connection with our needs. I think we have mentioned that already in Hebrews 2, where we see an indication of these two functions. He's the high priest, he was here on earth. That's one of the first points. He died here on earth. He suffered for, uh, for sins. He uh, has uh, completed the work of expiation and propitiation. He had to be here on earth in order that he could help us now being in the glory. That is what we find here in these verses. But he had to be also the Son of God. A mere man could never have done this. And we, we see here again, so, the greatness of our Lord Jesus. And then this fourth uh, encouragement or appeal, let us hold fast the confession. He is the high priest of our confession. He is the one we confess. What a wonderful privilege it is that we may confess Him in this world where He is rejected. Let us hold fast the confession. And in another sense, let us hold fast Him who is the object of our confession. For we have not a high priest not able to sympathize with our infirmities, but tempted in all things in like manner sin apart. Here we see what the Lord has done when he was here in this world. He uh, was tempted in all things. It's important to see that he is now in the glory. And from there he is sympathizing with us. But how is it possible that he may sympathize with us? Because he was here in this world and he was tempted in all things in like manner. But then it says sin apart. There is this fundamental difference. The Lord had no point of contact in himself with sin. When we are tempted, we have the tendency, because of the flesh in us, to give in. Now the Lord, he really suffered because he want to, wanted to maintain God's rights. But he was never tempted in this sense, as we have in James 1 verse 13, that no man being tempted say, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil things, and himself tempts no one. There is no point of contact in God. God's nature uh, has, cannot have anything to do with sin. It's impossible. God cannot see sin. But there is another uh, 
way, we see, we may be tempted also in James 1, verse 2, count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various temptations. Here it is coming from God. God wants to bring out good material. He allows temptations to form us in his school, to have us as his sons, like we have seen a little bit in Hebrews 2 also at the end, where we see for in that himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to help those that are being tempted. That is what the Lord went through here on earth. But there is this one fundamental difference that he had no uh, no context for sin in himself. In that sense, we say uh, correctly, I think, he could not sin. He could have made uh, bread from these stones. He had the possibility to do it. And therefore, it was a temptation for him. But he suffered because he wanted to maintain God's rights. And he uh, kept his uh, dependence upon God. He did not act in independence. Never. And so we see in these uh, temptations of the Lord in Luke 4 and also in Matthew 4 these different forms in which the Lord was tempted and in which we may be tempted. But the Lord went through these temptations that he might help us now who are in the wilderness who aren't being tempted. And so he wants to help us now in connection with these circumstances of the wilderness. Could a high priest sympathize with sin if there is sin in my heart, sinfulness, not at all. We have seen the word of God condemns that once and for all. How could the high priest sympathize with these things that the word of God condemns? It's impossible. But he sympathizes with our infirmities because he realizes that when we want to do the will of God in these temptations, when we want to maintain God's rights, that we are inclined to let go or to fall, or at least this tendency, you know, these infirmities, these weaknesses. Weaknesses are no sins. But it is the possibility that you may give in, and ultimately, which might lead to sin. Now, even then, of course, we have provision in the Lord. If we have sinned, and then it's then the relationship with the Father and the Son in First John 1 and 2, then we have the Lord as our advocate to help us and to restore us. But that's not the point here. Here it is to prevent us from sinning. That to help us that we will not sin, that we will not give in. So here it is, he is sympathizing with our infirmities, our weaknesses. He knows what is in us. The, the possibilities we have to fall. And therefore he wants to strengthen us that we will not give in. He has, he has prayed even to Peter.